you know, even the Christian narrative can be understood as a comedy. Well, I mean, divine right comedy. Right back to Dante. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> always Dante. Right. Um, so I was thinking about last week's podcast uh, about Arrival. Uh, and one of the things we were talking about was how uh, Louise receives language um, from the aliens, and then that kind of changes her perspective. I was thinking that um, there's a, some interesting parallels with what's going on right now uh, with Democrats kind of redefining the term recession, saying that we're not in a mm-hmm. recession and what, what have you. I mean, I really feel like that uh, there's an undergirding concept there that like we can change your perception of reality if we change the language. And mm-hmm. you see that in like defining what a woman is, defining what racism is, like all these like manipulations are not just like this type of gaslighting of like, you're not, you know, we're, we're trying to control you in, in this, like, you know, um, it's not just about language. It's about the fact that perceiving happens through language. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, I just found that mm-hmm. really interesting, you know, in, from arrival to, you know, where we are now, uh, with this whole recession defining, redefining thing. It's so, it's so wild. It's like the Wikipedia article was changed, you know, and mm-hmm. it's like, mm-hmm. it's yeah, it's pretty crazy. That. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, what arrival, the movie, um, shows, uh, with the, in regards to the language, uh, concept is that language shapes your perception of reality. Yep. It shapes thought, um, you know, and, and that's what you're getting at with this idea of re- redefining the word, uh, of recession, but it, it shapes the way you perceive reality, more to the point. And so if you can control language, you can control how reality is perceived. And it's, and so, you know, the, the changing of the term recession is one example, but we even have, I think, a greater um, and more pressing issue is redefining the terms like man and woman, mm-hmm. right? If you can actually destroy those concepts, then you can... That's like foundational, right? Yeah. If masculine and feminine is is the fabric of our the foundation of reality, then you can control anything from that spring. Yeah, forward. I think it was just inevitable mm-hmm. that it was going to go there. Yeah. It's not yeah. like it just coincidentally happened that now we're at redefining what a man and a woman right. is. It's like this was inevitable. Yeah. Like if you keep doing this all the way down. Yeah. You just and get so that. in so you know in the movie, Luis, um, the the main character, uh, she receives a language from the aliens, and it allows her to perceive reality differently, mm-hmm. which allows her to transcend time. Um, and whereas, you know, our human languages are linear, so we perceive time and reality in a linear fashion, the aliens perceive language or have their language as circular, right? Mm-hmm. Like all the circles that appear uh, is a symbol for time, right? right? And so, but we see that even in our own languages where... And I think I mentioned this in the, re- the the previous podcast, but like the romantic languages are masculine and feminine words, right? And so even the way that we talk about everyday things, like you know, table in Spanish is mesa, mm-hmm. um, and the the a being feminine, mm-hmm. uh, and so we mm-hmm. un- like we even see like masculine and feminine in our in our world through our language. Yep. <clears throat> um, it's hard to see that in English, uh, but. Yeah, like that, that whole idea that like language is shaping reality is very evident, even in our modern languages. So, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah, it seems like there's a few things that are intertwined into one. You have ideas, language, and behavior. That I, it, it seems as though what the, kind of the left is hitting on is that ideas actually do, in fact, change how you behave. Right. And, and language, in fact, changes how you behave. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I guess you could say perception and behavior perhaps are maybe the same thing. But I think the idea is if we don't call it a recession, people will not behave right. like it's a, a recession. Yep. Right, right. So people will continue buying. They'll keep, keep mm-hmm. continue going out. They'll yep. continue living as though life is normal. Yeah. Um, That's a the theory anyway. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, um, that they're hoping... It, it, so it's it's interesting that you have something as immaterial as an idea or even perhaps language that is physically impacting behavior. Yeah. You know, right. you, you have a word that yeah. is becoming alive and enfleshed in behavior. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. the incarnational idea. Um, I, f- I feel like that's, it. you know, 
to kind of give the devil his due when they when the left says speech is violence mm -hmm. if you only exist in this kind of non-material like i think therefore i am world then what i say to you does alter your entire perception of reality and it kind of does a type of violence to your mm -hmm. cosmos you yeah. know so it's mm -hmm. kind of it's just kind of interesting right. to kind of think of it that way it's so easily um discarded and be like no it's not actual violence and that's not how laws work that we can't like limit speech but like that actually gives it gives more credence to the the primacy of free speech and like why we allow that to exist so that we can shape our worldview mm -hmm. and so in a sense it does a type of damage to our preconceived ideas and our cosmos but obviously it's not physical um it's just it's just interesting to see how 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 much they almost intuit about the the depth and the power of language mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, yeah as yeah. i was saying it, it seems like they're really hitting on something very very deep mm -hmm. and it's the intertwining of language and behavior um yep. from what i've been reading on um evolution language symbols religious behavior particularly language and religious behavior it seems as though i guess the the prevailing opinion right now among scientists evolutionary scientists is that language and religious behavior co-evolved mm. and they're not exactly sure which one came first if one did come first there was a you know, kind of a proto-language proto-religion that you know very simplified um and i mean this is obviously incredibly archaic yeah i mean this is going back thousands mm -hmm. and thousands of years and it's it's almost as if the left is hitting on an incredibly archaic idea yeah. which is right. change the language you change behaviors yeah. yeah well and and from a ph philosophical standpoint uh that's that's nominalism nominalism right oh yeah correct yeah you know, the, the idea that uh words don't actually have inherent meaning that you know there's no nature to mm -hmm. words and we can just essentially make up any word for anything and it's fine. Like as if like the, the, the word that we give an object is totally arbitrary. Um, but that can't be the case. Uh, there, there is uh, a naturalness to language. And you know, I, I don't know if I can exactly pinpoint exactly why that's the case, but I know that the opposite is not the case. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, you know, in a sense, if, if I just say, well, I want the word hate to mean love. And so now I'm just like, you know, a man tells his wife, oh, I hate you, but I mean I love you. Right, like that's not going to fly. Like, there's something about uh, the words that actually are attached to reality and nature, and so you can have obviously um, made up words, uh, you know, for new things. Right, a language evolves, uh, and so there is some convention in words, uh, but I do think that uh, there's also a, a natural, uh, a naturalness in words as well. It's almost a combination of both. It's like it, it's convention. But it's also natural. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and if we take the, the idea that man is a lawmaker, that, you know, by his decrees, reality can be changed in a sense, right? Uh, to an extent, you know, uh, yeah. you push that idea too far and then you're destroying reality. Mm -hmm. and, and that's not the case. But, you know, laws are, uh, they do uh, bind us in a legitimate way. And one of the ideas that we see man creating laws is through language. You know, the words that he comes up with. Like when, when um, Adam is, in Genesis, Adam is given the power to name the animals, mm -hmm. right? And those become the animals' names. Right. And those names are attached to those natures. And so there is, you know, yes, man is imposing his own convention, but at the same time, God is allowing him to have this power over nature. Yeah, like type of participation. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. language is, I think, a really clear example of how man has has can establish laws over nature, mm -hmm. uh, and and that can reflect na uh, na nature uh, yeah. and reality. I think it's important to know that it's in it's in concordance with how reality works because mm -hmm. you can redefine a recession, but we're still in a recession. You know, yeah, like things like mm -hmm. that, where it's like you can redefine man and woman, but at the end of the day, there's still man and woman. Yeah. Um, so it's like yeah. we had that dominion, but always, again, always subdued, like in light of God. You know, like it's yeah. it's always in in participation with something higher. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. and then and then we have that ability to. Yeah, and we can't, you know, another another way we that uh, that we see uh, language uh, being connected to meaning is through the sacraments, and you know any sacrament that 
I do as a priest, you have to have the proper words. And so you ca- I cannot consecrate the bread and the wine at the altar by just saying any words I want and then intending to consecrate it. Mm-hmm. You know, if I mess up on the words and say, well, I meant to consecrate it, it's still invalid, mm-hmm. right? And so those words have to be attached to its proper meaning. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, there's no dualism in, in that language, yep. in language in general. Uh, you, you, your words have to relay what they mean, <laughs> essentially. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so. yeah. I, I think in ritual, in blessing, in curses, you know, basically kind of religious mythical language, that's where you see the power of words. Yeah. Um, yeah. This one author that I was reading said the reason why he thinks that religious behavior and language co-evolved together was because as language developed and became more complex for humans, so did the ability to lie and cheat. Mm. Mm. That That's people could now <clears throat> deceive people, and right. that would be uh, very detrimental and in, in, in the worst interest of the group. So how do we keep the group together? Mm. It's like, well, you start having blessings for those who tell the truth and curses for those who do not tell the truth. Interesting. So it, it, they're trying to um, shape a certain reality based on the the sacredness of words. Mm-hmm. Right, right. Yeah, that's super interesting. Uh, like you said, it's not just, you can't just say anything you want. And then mean it. And, and, and yeah, exactly, yeah, you know, exactly. and yeah. it, but it's, it, you are beholden to uh, the, the sacredness of language and what, and what these words mean. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and not just intention. Yeah. But what, what, like, what, what meaning they have in themselves. Right, right. Yeah, I like, I really like that idea, the sacramental idea, because it really kind of, ties in the idea that like Christianity is incarnational. Oh yeah, absolutely. And so yeah. like we have language and we have ideas, but they're not like out there floating. Yeah. And the way that, that that's like experienced is in an embodied manner. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I, I just, I feel like that's such an important concept, especially like, you know, like we were just talking now about contrasting that with the left's idea of speech being violence. And it's like, well, you know the 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 thing you have to first ad, like admit to in order to think that is that we're disembodied mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know like so like there's this deincarnational idea that we like float outside of our bodies yeah and we're some sort of being which is weird because like they you know they're the ones that are more likely to claim that i'm not spiritual or the most atheistic mm-hmm. and yet their ideologies are so disembodied yeah um that it, it like they're they just like come full circle yeah. and are now talking about some sort of like this idea world where what you say and your language does damage to who I am like in a physical way. Like it's, it's so weird. Um, so like in order to tie that all in together, in order to get the right framework with that is this Christian idea of like incarnational yeah. world. Right. Yeah. And we, you know, we see, we say that uh, Christ is the word of God and that mm-hmm. is not an arbitrary title. Right. I think you know, if if we understand Christ as the fullness of revelation, uh, as in revealing the mind of God, then it makes sense that he would be considered the word, because that's what words do. When when a, a word is communicated, the speaker of that word is revealing his thought to the spoken, right? Mm-hmm. And so, in God the Father sending his son, is essentially, essentially him revealing himself to the world. And this is why it's it's so important that, you know, he became man, right? He became a human. Right. The logos uh, becomes flesh. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, he couldn't just he couldn't just become he could not have just become a rock or a dog. Like mm-hmm. it, it's fitting because it, it it's in concordance with reality. Uh, and, and that's where we see, you know, that that word being attached to reality. Uh, and and that ultimate reality being God Himself, who, who's yeah. being revealed. Yeah, so. I was I was thinking about that idea uh, about about logos, and it seems as though you could say God is the one who speaks, and we're the ones who listen. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. that's revelation, right? You know, God yeah. is speaking, and we are <clears throat> receiving it. Yep. Um, Saint Bonaventure uh, has kind of a a an analogy from you know speaker listener. I don't know if you remember this, Father Jonathan. From our St. Bonaventure class. Yes. Um, back in the day. Yeah, so <laughs> back when we were so young. Yeah. Um, but he, he talks about 
when somebody speaks, they generate an internal concept of what they want to say. Mm-hmm. And then they speak it. Mm-hmm. And then by speaking it, it becomes audible and external. Mm-hmm. And, in clo- and it's clothed in words, as he says. Mm-hmm. It's like yeah. Christ is clothed in flesh. And then it's received by the hearer. But the word still remains inside the speaker's mind. Yes. So kind of in the same way, uh, Christ is the Logos, the word of God that was spoken into the world, incarnated into the world, but yet remains in the mind of God. Yes. Remains yeah. with yeah. God. Yeah. At, yeah. at all times. Yeah. There's um, there's a great analogy um, by uh, the philosopher Wittgenstein. Uh, he, he, he did a lot of writings on um, language. And he has this uh, beetle in a box analogy. I think I mentioned this to you years mm-hmm. ago. Um, but essentially, he, he says that language, you can equate language and communication uh, with language uh, as, as people in a room and everyone has a box. And only uh, each person can only see what's in their box. And everybody has a beetle. And they might, you know, the beetles might vary uh, in their um, accidents, you know, like the, maybe different colors, whatever. But essentially, everyone has a beetle. Mm-hmm. And it's only by communicating and describing your beetle to other people that they can begin to say, well, yeah, that's how my beetle looks like. Or, you know, that, that, that's equatable to, yeah, uh, my beetle. And they, they start to form this, like, more perfect image of a beetle. Right. And, you know, I think that that's what... Uh, I, when I remember, I remember um, hearing that um, in philosophy in my, one of my philosophy classes, and equating that to the logos, mm-hmm. and how, like, the father is sharing his ideas of how we should be, right? <laughs> and and when we see Christ as the perfect man, mm-hmm. we're like, oh yeah, like I see some of that in me, right? Or that's what uh, like the ideal man looks like, and. Right. And it's in Christ where, like, you know, the beetle in the box, like, the, for the Father is describing what he wants for us. Yep. And then we're able to see our own beetle, right? We're able mm-hmm. to see what's in our box that no one else can see and then piece that together and then come to a, like, this image of, yeah, the ideal man and then strive towards that. And, uh, you know, I think that's, that's what, like, the fullness of revelation means on a practical level is that we're seeing things that we can attribute to our own souls as well. Yep. Uh, and, and that's like the idea of the Christian is to imitate Christ, like the imitation of Christ, mm-hmm. to equate like all those pieces of the image of God in your soul and then comparing that to the image of the Son, right? Who reveals right. the image of the Father. Um, yeah, that's really interesting because um, there's also an aspect of that that uh, well, the idea of language is like being, you know, you only need language if you're communicating to somebody else. Yeah, mm-hmm. right, um, right, right. And so it, well, it, it necessitates yeah, yes, yeah. that there is a dialogue yeah. and, that, and that there is a uh, some an other yeah. to communicate with. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And so, like, you have to presuppose that somebody else has a beetle in their box. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and that's, Andrew Claven calls that, like, the great speculation. Yeah. That, like, you have your own perceived reality that is trying to understand truth, and so do I. Yeah. And then we're in dialogue of what that is, and right. then there's a reality outside of us that is revealing itself right. to both right. of us. Right, because mm-hmm. you, can, you can fall into this Cartesian, like, dualistic idea that the only thing that I can be assured of is that I exist. Yeah. And so I have no idea mm-hmm. what's in your mind. And yep. so, you know, what's the point of communicating? What's mm-hmm. the point of even trying to find connections? What's the point of trying to ascend to truth together if I can't even stand on, uh, you know, this foundation that you have, yep. uh, your own in our world, just like I do. Yep. And so there is that like foundation that you have to rest on, uh, that you have to, to presuppose. Yeah, it really is like, like a type of leap of faith. Yeah, it is. And, yeah. But I mean, the you, you can almost disprove it in a sense, uh, that Cartesian um, duality from a reductio ad absurdum. Um, like, you know, yeah. just like if you follow that uh, thought process to its logical end, it's absurd. Yeah. You end up bec- creating a god out of yourself because all you can rely on is your mind, right? Mm-hmm. And so it's like, well, if the only thing I can be sure of is that I exist, then that means that your foundation is that I am all that is. I yeah. am who <laughs> am, yeah, yeah, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so you are yeah. essentially creating yeah. yourself to be God. Mm-hmm. And so that's just absurd. I, I yeah. think like on an in- intuitive level, that just falls apart. 
And so we can, yes, it's a leap of faith, a leap of faith to assume, not or to assume, to, to believe that you have your own inner life just as I do. Yeah. But the opposite of that, again, leads, right. leads to yeah. absurdity. Yeah. So, yeah. It, it, it seems like language is originally develops as a way to all communicate this reality. That mm-hmm. we're all, like, are you seeing the same thing I'm seeing? Yeah, exactly. Kind of thing. Yeah. Um, I know evolutionary biologists are struggling with why did we develop this at all? Mm-hmm. Um, and it seems as though symbolic thinking is possible um, for some species of chimpanzees, I think it is. Mm. But they said not at the level that we do it. Mm-hmm. And then two, there is nothing in nature that allows for animals to develop it. It's so arduous and it takes so much time and so much training that only humans could have done this and why. So the, so the only, so are you saying that when it's popped up in chimps is because humans are like testing them? Correct. Right. So you can train them to mm-hmm. get to some level, yeah. but nothing in nature occurs like that. Interesting. Outside of humans. And yeah. so it, I guess you have to ask, what is the existential situation where humans had to ask questions yep. and they had to develop some sort of language yep. and pictures and yep. symbols what was going on yep. and i wonder if it's a certain heightened self-consciousness mm-hmm. yeah that again yeah. are you seeing what i'm seeing yeah what's going on in your mind what's going on in my mind right how do we group together how do yeah. we you know and and you know i think you know to push back on the idea like the evolutionists and and, and biologists would you know look at say like Look at the bees, like they communicate with dance, right? Is that kind of a form of language? Mm-hmm. But I, th- I think when those questions arise and, and you're equating um, uh, anything non-human to humans and saying, look, it's almost similar, I think there's a danger in forgetting just how far advanced humans are. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it's funny because I remember one example, I can't remember where I heard it, where uh, people were um, uh, uh, using... Uh, monkeys as an example of how they can use a stick as a tool right. to get food out mm-hmm. of a tree or yeah. something like that you know and, and yeah. just pick out bugs yeah, yeah. And they're like look they're just like humans i'm like no no yeah. no no like while the monkey can take the stick and find food yeah. the human can take the stick and carve a flute and play beautiful music right right you know right. what i'm saying like right. there's something like right. way above mm-hmm. what occurs in nature and right. i think that we can see that in language too that mm-hmm. you know, the bees are communicating mm-hmm. to find food and for their survival. Yeah. But you know, look at l- the language of men yeah. and how we can create poetry and yeah. music, something that's beyond utility. Right. Yeah. I I don't know if this is a true distinction or if it's uh if they're maybe one and the same. But I would say it seems it seems like many animals communicate. Like mm-hmm. oh, I should say all animals communicate. Yeah. But not all have language. Yes. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's a good distinction. You know, I, I don't know if that's one that maybe a scientist would have an objection to, but most, most certainly, you know, obviously animals communicate with each other. They have mm-hmm. to, but we actually have language that communicates multi-level things. Like, mm-hmm. the, yeah. you know, you don't look at, uh, like you said, bees dancing and there's like the anagogical sense, yeah. the, you know, the moral yeah. sense, <laughs> right, right, right. you know, the mythical sense. It's just like, uh, mm-hmm. they have to get work done, yeah, but yeah. we don't just get work done. Yeah. 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 And you know, we communicate yeah. stories and narratives and religion yeah, um, exactly. You know, that's the fantasize. thing with like the understanding of the human as a both and. You know, yeah. like we have an animal mm-hmm. part of us. Yeah. But we also have a, a spiritual transcendent part. Yeah. Um so it's it's right. not to say that we we don't have those mechanisms within us. Of course. But it's kind of like uh it, it's it's a fallacy to be like because I can find a biological uh, Connection analogy, yeah, yeah. yeah, parallel to something else in nature. Therefore, the spiritual doesn't exist. Right, it's like, right. That's not that's not how that works. Right, right. Mm-hmm. It's 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 yes and more. Right. Yeah. Um, but going going back to um one of your points, I wanted to add to it. Uh, you said that like language is uh, useful for communicating to others, or, or mm-hmm. that's you know the purpose is communication. Uh, yes, but it's also used to communicate with ourselves, and so even uh, on a uh, just on the level of self. Detach from other people as much as you can mm-hmm. do that. You know, uh, it's hard to detach yourself entirely. We are like relational beings, but um, even in your own mind, you have to use language to formulate your own thoughts. And so, even like this communication with yourself, there's almost a when you're formulating thoughts, there is a dialogue with yourself that you're yeah. having. Yeah. Uh, and, and this is my favorite example of that is in Augustine's Confessions. 
uh, where he's like writing this journal essentially to himself, right? And he's re- referring to God, of course, and he mentions other people, but mm-hmm. it's almost like a reflection in himself. And I remember uh, one example is when his friend um, passed away, like one of his closest friends died, and uh, he's asking himself questions, like, why am I so sad? Why am I, like, why is the mm-hmm. reality around me dark? And then he reaches a conclusion. And so, and that's what the best of dialogues do, is that there's, you know, uh, the, the speaker and the spoken to the, and the interlocutor, and they're arriving to some truth. Yeah. Um, but when you're, when you're thinking to yourself, when you're alone, mm-hmm. you are essentially partaking in a conversation with language, with yourself. To right. talk to yourself, right? Yeah. And, um, and we see this with, like, you know, and it's not just Augustine, but a lot of spiritual writers, um, that relationship with God in you, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, looking at yourself as another person almost. Yeah. And it's a really interesting dynamic that you can have a conversation with yourself. Um, yeah, that, that like, that, like uh, opens a whole can of worms of, like, consciousness being this, like, conglomeration yeah. of multiple passions and, and principalities that, like, you're in charge of and being in charge of, you know, yeah, like, yeah. um, like St. Paul says, like, I do what I don't want to do. Mm-hmm. Like and that I, whole like struggle. Thing. Yeah. I, yeah. I do, yeah. Um, so it's yeah. like, how is it that you're telling you like, you know, like I should, I should work out, but why aren't you working out? Like, like what yeah. is it that's controlling you? Are you talking to yourself or is there something else you're talking to right, that right. you're participating in? It's so, um, it's a mystery. Yeah. yeah. That, that mm. conversation with yourself is a mystery. And I think there is an element of, um, you know, you can you can consider it as talking to God essentially, and mm-hmm. like you find God within you. Yeah. Um, but it's not like God is detached from you inside of you. Yeah. Like there's this, the union of your soul and God's image is it's inherent to it, mm-hmm. and so, you know, that distinction of like who yeah. you're talking to is maybe a little blurred. Yeah, I don't, I don't think don't, it's don't arbitrary yeah. either that you know like the second person of the Trinity is logos. No, you know, it's absolutely. not just like a yeah. useful tool. The way God talks to us, it's like no, like the the description of God's essence. Yeah, has like there's something about language that's part of that. Yeah, you know, like that's yeah. like a major part, not just like yep. the thing, like the means by which He absolutely. communicates. Like it's yeah. it's part of His nature. And that's like the the, the Trinity is three persons, but they're one. Uh huh. Isn't and, and 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 Augustine uses that um the image of the Trinity. Uh, or the, the the truth of the Trinity, he relates it to the person, and, yeah, and yeah, it's the, the powers it? of the soul, yeah, right. It's so memory. It, um, is it and intellect, memory, and will? Yeah, I I, I, th- I think those are the three. Yeah. Um, but I think that's really helpful because like you have again like one being, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Right. And it's it's tricky to talk about the the Trinity, um, like persons, self. Uh, one, and, and it's it's yeah. the deepest mystery. It's the central mystery. Right, right. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, like to look at yourself and see how you dialogue with yourself and right. the union of, you know, yes, there's distinctions of body, soul, but they're united, yeah. right? And and that connection between the two mm-hmm. and to talk to yourself and yeah, those ideas true. that you're reaching to. And so in the Trinity, you have the Father and the Son and that eternal love, which is expressed by the Holy Spirit. Right. Um, that's there's there's a sense of an eternal dialogue right mm-hmm. in in the Trinity um, right. that we can even see reflected in yeah ourselves right so. you, the minute you're alone you immediately started a self dialogue yeah 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 right. I, I thought about that years ago I, I read it in a, a spiritual writer's book and it just like blew my mind I was like wait this is exactly correct because I I'd never really thought about it because you just do it right right yeah. the minute you stop talking to somebody and you walk into the next room and you're alone you're talking to yourself right. yeah. Right. Immediately, right, yeah. <laughs> like immediately, you have thoughts. And, uh-huh. It's like, so why, why did I say that? Or like, oh yeah, that was interesting. Like, and you repeat the things. Yeah, that or like, saying. I'm really hungry. Yeah. Right. Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly. You, yeah, even whatever if you're thinking is, about yeah. mundane things, it's like you're constantly actually talking to yourself. Yeah. yeah. Whether yeah. you know it or not. That's wild. And yeah. you have to use language to do that. That's the and that's the, that goes back to yeah. the point mm-hmm. is that you, there is no such thing as a thought without language, really. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. Um, pivoting. I want to um, talk about beauty a little bit. Um, I just finished uh, the conversation with Jordan Peterson, Jonathan Peugeot, and John Verveke. Um, that I came out. I haven't started that yet. Yeah, it's I, I it's wild, um, <laughs> but it's really interesting because he they they talk about um, the three transcendentals a lot: truth, mm. goodness, and beauty. And and we've had this conversation before about how it's really interesting to see that pop up in their circle mm-hmm. because. It doesn't 
it doesn't seem like it gets communicated a lot up until recently. It's like we're talking about the transcendentals again. That used to be mm-hmm. like this like thing that you know. It's a, yeah, like a, like a if philo- you know you know philosophy thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Aquinas brings it up, but yeah. it is kind of like it does seem like a uh, an esoteric conversation. Yeah, um, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. So. Um, so we were, we're also reading in our book study, uh, Carl Stern's flight from women. Yeah. Um, and he talks about these two concepts. Um, I have a bunch of notes here. I want to kind of just go through. Yeah. Um, he talks about the idea of scientific knowledge versus poetic knowledge, uh, and scientific knowledge being this kind of separating, like dissecting Mm -hmm. to know something versus poetic knowledge is to bring things together and then to see that as a whole, as a whole. Right. Right. So it's a different type of knowledge, um, and so he he kind of claims that the the ultimate version of poetic knowledge of bringing things together is faith, mm-hmm. um, and that I mean that's what we were talking about, like you know, kind of to tie that into that whole Descartes idea of I have to assume somebody else has their own internal experience, um, and then you can kind of say that if you follow his train of thought all the way down, then you kind of go insane. Mm -hmm. So what you're essentially, you're still left with to like the only way that you can kind of make that claim that somebody else does have an internal experience is to look at things and start to make connections and then kind of take a leap of faith. Like you still can't, you can never dissect it. Mm -hmm. Like I can never dissect your brain and find your own internal life. I have to look at other things around me and start to layer them. And then I can posit a leap of faith. And that's that's yeah. a poetic knowledge right. um, that's needed. So you can't do it through, through dissecting through mm-hmm. the scientific method. Um, so with that, um, the the way that kind of ties into beauty is that beauty is uh, this is what Verveke was saying. How beauty is like the disclosure of uh, of the world, as opposed to a kind of like pulling apart. He called the her, uh, the hermeneutics of. Suspicion, suspicion and faith. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, faith yeah, versus suspicion. faith. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So the her- hermeneutics of suspicion is like that kind of like, let's pull this apart and find out what's really underneath. Yeah. Um, versus the hermeneutics of faith, which is like we bring things together in a poetic knowledge way and then see its beauty. That's yeah. what Verveke is saying. Um, yeah. I thought about the, the idea of St. Thomas, the doubter, when he says, I must put my finger in his side. To believe. To believe. Yeah. And it's yeah. a type of piercing, mm. a type of dissecting. Yeah. Of like, it's not mm. until I know this this way yeah. that I will believe. Yeah. Um, and so there's something to be said yeah. about like wow. the, this kind of science Science kind of un- unveils these realities and yeah. then you can make a posit. But at the end of the day, you need to make that leap yeah. of faith. Like you're left at that line. Right. And then Christ says, blessed are those who have not seen but believe. Yeah. So it's like, there's a different type of way of knowing yeah. that he could have pulled things together, realities together yeah. to, to make that claim. Wow. Um, yeah, that's, that's, there's a lot there. <laughs> um, just in your, um, I like the analogy that you uh, use with uh, St. Thomas. Um, I must put my finger in his side uh, to believe. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it was, it was, is it Caravaggio's painting of? Uh, yes. Yeah. The, yeah. Uh, St. Thomas mm-hmm. coming to believe. Can't remember exactly what it's titled. But that, painting caused a lot of controversy because um in the um touching of thomas to christ there's uh like a sexual uh yeah uh, uh, kind of um uh, illusion mm-hmm. a- and um almost an explicit like mm-hmm. um image and but i think that that's exactly right and it's getting to this idea that carl of carl stern's um scientific mode of knowing yep where it's like this is thomas trying to use his scientific mind yep piercing yep. right um, masculinity. like the masculinity yeah. mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. trying to obtain faith right and uh i just like that just i just connected that yeah. now <laughs> in this yeah. moment yeah but that like caravaggio was actually getting at something mm-hmm. um saying yeah, yeah like that sexual imagery yeah is it's um, a real thing is a real thing yeah. because that's what the masculine spirit mm-hmm. wants to do is to pierce everything yeah yep. and and um in, in the book that we're uh, reading um Flight from Woman, uh, he uses that term, um, the rape of nature, right? Yeah. Or the rape of wisdom. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and like, if if we simply relied on a scientific me- method, if we simply relied on the masculine, uh, then we, we are essentially doing that. We're ruining nature, right? Yeah. And there's not a reverence towards it. Right. Um, 
So yeah, that's uh, that's a really interesting connection. Yeah, I, I've heard um, Saint Thomas called. I've heard him called uh, Saint Thomas the empiricist. <laughs> really? <Yeah. laughs> um, you know that he that's said, I, "I need to see. Yeah, I need to feel, yeah. and then I will believe." Yeah. Um, right. Not not just this leap of faith. Mm-hmm. Not a pulling together, not intuitive. Yeah. Um, and perhaps uh, he could be contrasted with uh, Mary. You know, if, if Elizabeth says to Mary, uh, "Blessed are you who believed." What was told to you? Would you know? Yeah. Would yeah. would happen? Yep. Um, you kind of have this these two just juxtaposing figures. Um, I will not believe until I see and touch. Yeah. Versus, yep. blessed are you who believed what you were. What was revealed to you? Yeah, right. And what you know that without you with, seeing. without seeing. Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. Um, yep. And then I guess Christ reiterates that when he yeah. says to, to Thomas, uh, "Blessed are those who have not seen, yeah, yet right. believe." Right. But you know, it's interesting because Christ does not negate Thomas's belief because uh, yeah. ultimately, uh, even through using empirical methods mm-hmm. to um, uh, to come to believe, yep. he still professes our Lord as. Um, my Lord and my God, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and he falls to his knees, and yep. he does believe. Yeah, and, and even uh, Christ affirms that, and he says, "Like you have believed because you have seen." Yeah, but blessed are they who do not see mm-hmm. and yet still believe. And so, I think that that's true in uh, the scientific method. Is that right. it's not that it's um it, it cannot lead to knowledge. Right, it can. Um, and so we're not like you know denying. We're yeah. not science deniers. It's to say too, right? like it's like if you if you're a Christian because you agree with the five proofs for Christ or five, five proofs for God. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah, like yeah. The, those type of arguments, the five it's like, to know that's God. great. Yeah. But blessed are those who have not seen and believed. Yeah. You know I'm saying it's right. like, that, mm-hmm. that's not an invalid way to come to faith. Right. Well, and but the thing is like you could, but it's never one or the other. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so like, you know, you do have Thomas's five ways uh, for the proof of the existence of God, mm-hmm. but that does not um, lead you to a relationship with him. And so, and this is Thomas's important point, is that you can come to know that God exists on a purely natural level. Right. But just knowing that God exists is not enough. Right. Like, you have to love him, right? Well, so in order to mm-hmm. love in anybody or commune with them, communicate, is it back to that language thing? It's yeah. like, you need to make the presupposition that they have an internal life. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know what I'm saying? Like that they have their own. Yeah. That's that's actually other and not just sub projection of your own. Right. And that again takes you at a at a crossroads of I have to make a leap of faith yeah. to assume that. That's right. like Clavin's great speculation. Right. And if you don't make that leap of faith, then you're just going to be trapped in your own yeah. world. Uh-huh. You, can, you can't make any meaningful mm-hmm. connections right. or relationships. So So seeing those connections um like in that poetic way of like bringing things together and then and then seeing it in this type of knowledge I think that's what Verveke is really getting at with beauty. Mm-hmm. Of like beauty is that like awe and the splendor of truth. Yeah. Right? The the splendor of the things that you pull together and then see as like wow, this is this is it. Yeah. Um I cuz cuz I was thinking listening to that conversation I was like this is amazing and really complicated but who's going to listen to this? You know, like how many people are going to listen to it? Like, the, like yeah. the edges of the bell curve. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, it and has it has a few hundred thousand. Uh, uh, sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My point is, like, the everyman. Like, this is. It's so hard to like now yeah. communicate this stuff. Right. With like, what do you do now? Yeah. Um. So, or how does it help me on a practical level? How yeah. Do I, exactly. How do I understand a jargon? And not know? so yeah. much like a pragmatist way of like, net, like, you know, how is this useful? But it's like, how does this affect my reality? Yeah. Like, how does this language reshape my yeah. perception? Um, I was thinking about, <clears throat> we're starting up uh, school again with our kids. Um, and my wife and I homeschool, and we use the Charlotte Mason method. Um, basically, just her philosophies on education. It's really just like an understanding of who the person is, who a child is, like what they need. Like it's a lot of psychology and philosophy mm-hmm. um, around a kind of method of educating. Yeah. Um, so she has this uh, kind of tenant that... Um, Education is the science of connections. Um, and so yeah. this, is, this relates to like, how is this applicable to like everybody? Yeah. So moms and dads, what have you, right. like myself as a father, I'm thinking about this stuff. Um, so education is the science of connections. Made me think about this conversation in this kind of poetic knowledge, mm-hmm. this type of uh, admiration of beauty. Um, and she has this idea of like, you give a child a varied feast and that's what education is. Yeah. They start to pull connections from 
uh, science and math and art and, you know, crafts and what have you, like all these different things, all these different elements, you give them in their, their, their best form. Yeah. And then it's through those connections that they make this aha moment that this stuff relates to something transcendental. Yeah, right, exactly. And, you know, if we believe that all knowledge leads to God, the source of all truth, then, you know, these different subjects are not going to be competitive with each mm -hmm. other, right? They're actually going to lead to the same place. Yep. And so, and, and we've talked about this before, but that's the idea, uh, like the classical idea of a university, right? One universe, mm -hmm. one verse, like all these verses, yep. multi-layered verses, but then unifying them, right? Is that they're in, in, going back to language, they're in an eternal dialogue with each other. Uh, that leads to the same place. Mm -hmm. uh, and so a properly educated person, in a classical sense, will come to know about God more, <laughs> in a sense. Uh, so, yeah, I, that's, a really, that's a really good uh, understanding of education, because I think uh, in our postmodern world, we want to... We treat education as a way to be uh, hype... Like, uh, just focused in one area, right? Yeah, uh, practical. Pra yeah. Specialization. Specialization, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, oh, I came out of college to get my business degree so that I can work in this office building. Right. And it's like, well, what does that say about the quality of your life? What does that right. say about like who you, who you are as a man? Right. Like, what do you know? But there's right? also a manner in which learning about business, I know this experientially, learning about business also reveals certain truths about reality. No, and so that's yeah. like the role right. of the educator. This is like where it ties into homeschooling and such, is that it's the role of the educator to make sure that that is communicated yeah. that way and to present. It's almost like an artistic expression yeah. or even a, like a, the role of a priest or the role of an artist is to bring these things together, these realities, and show that they're connected. Yeah. So it's like, of course, you have. we need business people. Not everybody <clears throat> can be a literature major. Of you course, know, like, yeah. So, yeah. And that's a good thing. It's not like a oh, it's a it's a necessary evil. Like we this right, is a right. this is a good world that we yeah. live in, um, and so it's it's the method of educating that is really at that's that's really being um, scrutinized here. Mm -hmm. And it's not necessarily that you get a business mm -hmm. education. Mm -hmm. It's right, the fact that if you understand that this participates in a bigger reality, yeah. that's how education should work. Right. 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 I mean that that is the. The classical understanding of the liberal arts college and liberal arts education is you take all these samplings, you get a little bit of everything, but then you, you see how it all connects. Mm -hmm. It's not just to kind of be a, a jack of all trades, yeah. right. but to see the interconnection of them. And that was yeah. certainly the idea of the medieval university was you know, the medieval scholastic students took all these subjects because they were all under, ultimately under the umbrella of the, you know, the queen of the sciences theology, which is the study yeah. of God. Yep. But the idea was that God has revealed himself in grammar, mm -hmm. in yep. logic, yep. in rhetoric, in math, in geometry, yeah, in yep. astronomy, all, all these subjects yep. were all things that led to God yep. eventually. Um, of course, now I don't think, uh, you know, theology is the queen of the sciences is the thing that holds it all together. But it, it's, it's still even interesting there that the, in the universe, the thing that, brought together all those one things was the idea of the study of God. Yeah. yeah. That in God were all these, the plurality of things made right. one. Yeah, exactly. That's yeah. That's the yeah. highest study. It's that like multiplicity and unity at the same time. Yeah. Like you can't right. just, you can't just have this like, uh, uh, kind of singular thing that everybody should study. Yeah. Like the multiplicity exists and there's a way that Christianity unifies both yeah. those things. There's, um, yeah. I think it was Einstein was said to, well, uh, well, Right. To, to go back to the idea of education, uh, it's, you know, if, if all these paths are leading towards God and knowledge of God, uh, and we can consider God like the truth, right? Like with a capital T, uh, that's also equatable with beauty. And as you were saying, uh, touching upon beauty, uh, but I remember I was just reminded that I think it was Einstein who was said to have like looked at equations and he knew that they were valid because they were beautiful. Mm. And so he would like look at an equation and say that because of its beauty, I can tell it's true, right? There's a yeah, that's like an integral mm. uh, way that they that they look, yeah, and, and which I can't even begin to imagine to mm. perceive. <laughs> uh, but you know, he equated that beauty with the truth of uh, mathematical equations. So. Yeah, yeah, true. I know that um, that kind of beauty experience, aside from you know beauty being 
this um kind of mistaken for just kind of aesthetically pleasing. Yeah. Um it's really like that splendor right. of truth. So it can even be conceptual. It doesn't have yeah. to be like this is like uh proportional. Yeah. You know? Mm. Um I was when I was listening to the Peterson lectures, biblical lectures, it, it was like a click in reading Carl Stern um about this way of poetic knowledge, it was like an aha moment for me that that's how I understood the biblical lectures mm-hmm. and seeing these different things being pulled together instead of uh, dissected. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? We didn't go into the historical origins of why Cain, the Cain and Abel story was written. It was like, I'm pulling in other parts of reality until it clicks for you. And yeah. then you're, you're struck by the beauty of it. Right. Um, right. Yeah. yeah. I, re- I remember going through the biblical lectures again uh, with my sister, with our sister. Um, and, we would meet once a week and go over it. And I was waiting for the aha moment because I knew it was a thing that was going to happen. Yeah. I was like, she's like getting these things as a concept. It's like, oh, that's really interesting. That's really interesting. It's like, but I, it hasn't clicked yet. Like the poetic knowledge hasn't shown up. Yeah. The the scientific knowledge is there. And it's like, oh, that, that's really interesting points about X, Y, or Z. But it wasn't until it was brought poetically. Yeah. I was like, okay, this is like now a whole way of knowing. Yeah, and that's, Mm -hmm. my aha moment was when I went to Belmont Abbey and studied literature. Mm -hmm. And because up until that point, you know, Matt and I, we we grew up Catholic. uh, And, you know, we were practicing, uh, you know, as as well as we could. But it was always an adherence to goodness and truth, right? And the idea that, you know, I was very attracted to this idea of spiritual warfare. Mm-hmm. You know, you have to fight to be a man and, and to, you know, be a good Christian. Andrew Tate vibes. Yeah, uh, yeah m- maybe, I guess. Uh, yeah. The spiritual Andrew Tate. I, I was embodying Andrew Tate before he was a thing. Jeez. Right? <laughs> oh my gosh, no, no. <laughs> um, but it was never, um, I don't think it was ever like integrated in my soul until I saw the different verses mm-hmm. studying literature and what made literature good, studying philosophy and theology, I was like, wow, this is actually attractive, right? Yeah. And, and it's not just uh, this adherence to truth on a, uh, uh, not an artificial level, because I think we were trying to be good Catholics, but it felt much deeper than that when I was able to see the connectedness of all things. Yeah. And, and yeah, like you said, it was my aha moment, um, yeah. realizing the path of beauty, um, and mm-hmm. that, you know, these truths that we were following uh, to the best of our abilities uh, led to something more and something much deeper, which could be described as beautiful. Yeah. So. I, I think it's somewhat related, but one of the internal proofs, I think, for the existence of God, um, you know, you have the five ways, which are the external, and then you have more kind of existential and in, internal, is I think it's it's not the beauty of the Gospels, but it's almost like the the peace or harmony. Mm. Mm. Interesting. Insofar okay. as when Christ, the, the parables and teachings of Christ seem to resonate with how things are. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You, you, I mean, you, you, yeah, you, you read it yeah, and you're yeah. like, oh, you know what? Yeah, it does seem like if I sell my soul, I lose. Yeah. Yes. But right. if I give my soul away... I gain everything. Yeah. That, that's what it seems yeah. like. That seems true. Yeah. And harmony. Yeah, exactly. That term yeah, so. harmony has a, a musical element. Right. That again, yeah. is only is, is like perceived via beauty. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, like like the song works and it's beautiful yeah. because it's because it's harmonious. Right. Yeah. Uh, because of all the facets coming together, all the different sounds create this oneness that you're perceiving. Yeah. Um, it's not a dissection. Yeah. So yeah, that, that's really interesting. And, you know, ultimately, like in education and studying the liberal arts, uh, we're we're studying in essence like the attributes of the human person and human nature and i i recently um my hebrew is not good i don't know how your hebrew is <laughs> but i under <laughs> I, not good I, I i read somewhere that in genesis when god cre- creates and he calls his creation good in hebrew that word can actually be translated to beauty mm. and so hmm. um it, it's um almost interchangeable yeah um, now, I, again, I'm not a Hebrew scholar. Uh, I, I don't know this like first, you know, firsthand, but this yeah. is what I was reading. And so, like, to understand now, imagine God creates and he says, this is beautiful. But then when he creates man, he says, this is very beautiful. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. And so that idea that, like, the beauty of human nature can actually lead us to the knowledge of God. Right. right. And now we're, not, now we're talking about God not as just capital, uh, capital T truth, but capital B beauty, right? right? 
And so the interchangeability of truth and yep. beauty, and of course goodness, yep. right? They're all convertible. Mm-hmm. Um, and when you were talking about um, just uh, beauty, it's not just an aesthetic or an aestheticism. Yep. Um, it, I think it's tempting to fall into an idea of an aestheticism when we separate beauty from truth and goodness. Uh, beauty without truth just becomes aestheticism. Yep. And you know, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Mm-hmm. It's like saying truth is in the mind of the beholder. Right. It's like, no, that's relativism, right? Yeah. And that's because you're separating truth from beauty. Right. Um, but if you combine them, then beauty <laughs> is still well, beauty is still in the eye of the beholder. And that's yeah. where it, it kind of leads to the primacy of beauty being like this consciousness perceptivity. Like perceptibleness of yeah. truth and goodness yeah. is via beauty. Right. Mind of the beholder has to be with a big asterisk. Yeah, asterisk yeah. As in, well, our human nature is universal. Right. Yeah. And so if you see one thing as beautiful and the other person and another person says it's not beautiful. Right. There's a difference of tastes, yes. Yeah. Um, but taste is not the same thing as beauty, right? Yep. Yeah. Um so when you you know, if you want to give validity validity to the statement that beauty is in the mind of the beholder. Um, then you can, I think the way to do that would be, yes, your subjective experience of beauty is valid, uh, but it is speaking to a more objective beauty. Yes. Um, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. I quickly looked it up on, uh, on the internet. Oh, did you? That was <laughs> yeah. It, wow. yeah. <laughs> uh, it looks like, I think, I think that's correct. Cause it, I guess it was, it could be good, agreeable or pleasant, mm. Okay. but pleasant, agreeable, I, I, th- I think yeah. beauty. I don't. I don't think beautiful would be too big of a stretch. It might be a little bit more poetic. Okay. Right. But okay. it seems like there is this idea that because um, I think uh, agreeable could be also harmonious. Yes. Okay. It could, you know, oh, you know if, yeah. if you think about it, if right. just kind of break it break it apart a yeah. bit. Yeah. So I do think you could say that God saw things and said it was harmonious or yeah. beautiful. Right. Right. I think yeah. That's that's fair. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Actually, if if you listen to that talk from Verveke Pajon Peterson, he talks about goodness mm-hmm. and being this like congruency with what you perceive and what really is yeah that the mm-hmm. the promise right. that that is true the promise that that actually correlates is goodness yeah um and so when god says this is good he's saying this correlates to a true reality yeah. which is and again and if he's a, if he is ultimately like consciousness itself perceiving this then it's beautiful yeah and that's how the three like relate and they're interchangeable yeah yeah. Uh, so, I mean, kind of going back to the whole postmodern thing, though, and then education is, um, I feel like we're in a really interesting time because postmodernism has, like, you know, fragmented everything. Deconstructed. Like everything is, yeah. yeah, deconstructed. And so we're, like, left with fragments on the ground of, like, hierarchy and, mm-hmm. and all these all these abstract um, parts of reality that, like, are not true cohesive. In a sense, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. but it's yeah, not they're scattered. Of, not a part of the bigger picture. Um, yeah. But now seems like a time for artists, for priests who are that kind of remembering mm-hmm. um, to really start to pick up the fragments. Mm-hmm. Like now is like now is like the ripe time to pick yeah. up the pieces. You know, like it's like it's it's there because we don't have to we don't have to deconstruct false notions. It's already been deconstructed. Yeah. Like we're here in the scattered world. And so like now is the time to gather things and like now is the time for the reign of beauty yeah, per se, yeah. you know, like it's, it's when we pull the things together again and show how it's pleasing. Yeah. Um, and I yeah. feel like now is the time to do that. And it, like more than ever. Um, and, and that's, that, I feel like that's, that goes through to education, yeah. uh, to artists, to like in my own, my own world of like writing music, um, to priests. Yeah. I, I just feel like now is the time for that. Yeah, and I think, you know, we as it relates to my life on a personal level, how I mentioned, you know, my aha moment was um, realizing that all these studies in literature, philosophy, theology led to God. It was an awakening to beauty. Mm-hmm. And again, like while my adherence to the truth and and to goodness was, you know, I was convinced in it. Um, it didn't connect and touch me on a deeper level. Uh, that's, I think that's, um, that, that path of beauty towards transcendence is really pertinent to, like you said, postmodern man. Because whereas postmodern man, I think we're, again, you know, we've said this multiple times, we're, we're in a crisis of meaning. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's not going to be, I just don't see the power of just 
you know, preaching truth divorced from beauty is yeah. not as attractive as preaching the beauty of truth, <laughs> right? Yeah, for sure. And so, mm-hmm. you know, you're not gonna like you're not gonna convince as many people just saying you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do this, you have to obey, just be blind. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, there is a way to live, and there's ways that lead to destruction. Mm-hmm. And you know, obeying the Ten Commandments does uh, is a good thing. But you have to understand that all of that is for the pursuit of something that's beautiful. Yeah. And if you don't understand that all those, like all the Ten Commandments, for example, all those do, "thou shall nots" is not for a greater yes, right? Right. Uh, then you've lost a picture. Mm-hmm. I think, and the greatest analogy that I can think of is, you know, a man or anyone being in love with another person. When you are truly in love, it possesses you to a point where you want to be a better person, right? Like, yeah. and, and and your old way of life is distasteful, right? You start seeing the world differently. And where a person who is in love can, you know, if uh, he's tempted towards let's say, lust or gluttony, all those temptations kind of don't have power over him because he's like, no, I'm in pursuit of something that's truly beautiful. Right. And those things are just, again, distasteful. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a quote from Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Um, I don't know if I... Can I read that now? You can read it now. Um, okay. <laughs> can I read that now? <laughs> that no time like the present. Um, but he kind of talks about this idea uh, where the path of beauty seems to be uh, very pertinent Mm. Um, to our times, uh, as opposed to the path of goodness and truth. Yeah. Um, and of course, like when I'm talking about these transcendentals, truth, goodness, and beauty, it's so easy to talk about them as if they're divorced. You know, I don't want to say that the path of beauty is divorced from truth and goodness. Yeah. Again, they're all convertible. But we're right? losing that element. Is like the whole point. Yes. Is that we're losing yeah. the the mm-hmm. beauty aspect, the poetic knowledge, yeah. the the femininity. Yeah. All of that is tied into like we're we need that back, yeah, and we yeah. need to have them. United. Right, exactly. And so this is from, um, again, um, Alexander Solzhenitsyn. I hope I'm saying that right. Solzhenitsyn. Um, and he says, um, It is vain to affirm that which the heart does not confirm. In contrast, a work of art bears within itself its own confirmation. Concepts which are manufactured out of whole cloth or overstrained will not stand up to being tested in images, will somehow fall apart and turn out to be sickly and pallid and convincing to no one. Works steeped in truth and presenting it to us vividly alive will take hold of us, will attract us to themselves with great power, and no one ever, even in a later age, will presume to negate them. And so this is where it it gets really uh, pertinent to what we're talking about. And he says, And so perhaps that old trinity of truth and goodness and beauty, beauty is not just a formal, outworn formula it used to seem to us during our heady, materialistic youth. That's going back to the time, uh, that idea that uh, these are not just old philosophical concepts that yeah. we're just dusting off, right? Mm-hmm. These are actually pertinent today. Um, then he says, uh, let me see. Uh, if the crests of these three trees join together, as the investigators and explorers used to affirm, And if the two obvious, two straight branches of truth and goodness are crushed or amputated and cannot reach the light, yet perhaps the whimsical, unpredictable, unexpected branches of beauty will make their way through and soar up to that very place, and in this way perform perform the work of all three. And so again, he's giving credence to the idea that maybe in our postmodern age, uh, and of course, he wrote this, wrote this a long time ago. But in our postmodern age, where truth and goodness are struggling to find traction in people's mm-hmm. hearts, the way of beauty seems the most powerful. Yeah, yeah I, so. I also like the the um, the caveat to this is that, um, or like a I guess an aside um, is that I don't I don't like this notion that this like that beauty gets like weaponized. No, uh, in the sense of fair. like, this is yeah. how you get people. Yeah, yeah, this is how like we get people on our side. It's like you have to go under the radar with beauty. It's like yeah. that. That seems so conspiratorial. Yeah, and yeah. like not. It's the, not propaganda. Yeah, it's wanna, uh, yeah. yeah, exactly. And it's also not the way. Like you, you kind of don't understand the human person in mm-hmm. that way. It's like you need to get them to see this. Yeah. It's a perceived thing. It's not like a convincing thing. Right. 
Um, well, and, and I think that um, once you treat it like that, like you're weaponizing it, and like, I just need to get people to see beauty. It's like, no, no, no. I need to stand among the people and observe beauty together. Yeah, right. right. Um, and so it's not this, like, hey, look at this, and I'm mm-hmm. on my pedestal preaching to you. Yeah. Because that's where I think um, truth gets weaponized, where you're just preaching down. Right. But I think, um, as Bishop Barron loves to say, and I think it's a great uh, example, true evangelization is one starving man telling another starving man where to find bread. Yeah, right. right. Yeah, that's really interesting. <laughs> uh, I mean, I think of that just good. in my own, you know, like I could I could think that I need to raise my kids uh, so that they think it the way I do. Mm-hmm. Or I can see it in the light of like, I have a responsibility to show them what I'm also trying to grasp at. Yeah. And so I'm I'm right. trying to pull things together to give them a varied feast so that they can perceive beauty which I am also trying to perceive. Yeah. Not like my idea on you. Yeah. You know, like it, this is like all I don't know, it just seems so foundational to understanding who the human person yeah. is and that's where evangelization like grows out of. Yeah. Yeah, we're mm-hmm. stumbling along the way together. Like, yeah. I think that's Peterson. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It will it seems like uh, truth right now is is of the three so you have truth is kind of a tricky topic you know what is truth mm-hmm. yeah you know and it's that, a buzzword it, right now right, right? you know it's punches I, pilot vibes yeah right. exactly <laughs> you know what is truth i don't like that you're using that word from matt walsh's documentary yeah, you yeah. Know? yeah that's right, right um and then you have goodness which seems also kind of odd right now because again mm-hmm. you have like the rise of the anti-heroes the nihilistic heroes right. yeah what um, is good yeah, exactly yeah. like what, what yeah exactly what is good um Whereas beauty may be the one that, uh, as that quote said, mm-hmm. might be able to, might be the one that rises up. Yeah. In an age where truth is kind of, is distasteful. Yeah. And goodness is seen as, um, I don't know, weakness or too innocent. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. You no, know, no, too absolutely. too naive. Soft. Yeah. Soft. Yeah. 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 And that's um, uh, Peterson makes that point in his biblical lectures. I remember, um, there's a, a clip that went viral from his lectures on um art. The mm-hmm. definition of art. Yeah. And uh, he made this great point where he's like, even the most like nihilistic punk rockers um, have a religious tendency when they're listening to their music, right? Uh, like they're listening to their music, they're immersed in it. Um, and maybe it's not, you know, the most artful music, of course, yeah. but they're, they're, they're perceiving something that transcends themselves mm-hmm. and they're finding meaning in it. Uh, and it's through that music that's maybe a, a muddled way towards transcendence and right. that's where we can have hope for the culture yeah is that even the most nihilistic uh atheistic uh, you know uh meaning denier po- uh, person mm. possible they still hmm. you can't escape uh a religious instinct and that yeah. religious instinct i think is best seen in art mm-hmm. and especially yeah. music like who's going to deny the beauty of music or right. who's going to deny the fact that music mu- moves you beyond yourself Right, isn't that yeah. pointing to something transcendent? Yeah, you know? yeah. yeah. Uh, working with that transcendent point, I wonder what you guys think of this, or if you guys have had this this experience. But sometimes when you you hear a very beautiful piece of music, I'm thinking of Gregorian chant. I have a soft spot for that, <laughs> um, and or, or very beautiful religious art. Sometimes you're not actually even listening to the music or looking at the art. It's like you're mm. beyond. Yeah, like yeah. your mind is taken somewhere else. Yeah, like you yeah. hear it and you see it, but your mind is taken somewhere else. Yeah. Yep. Because of the beauty of the music, yeah, it has to, and you start thinking about that thing, that yes, transcendent yep. thing. Yeah, yep. yep, that's what. And and in that same clip, uh, Peterson says, uh, art is like um, a window into the transcendent. Right, um, right. And so you're right. never, um, you're never, any good work of art, if you're truly gazing on it, um, you know, with a with a foundation of wonder, you're never just focusing on the aspects that make up the material, uh, that that yeah, that create the material makeup of the art, right? Look at the oils, or look at the yeah, yeah. you know the dimensions. Mm-hmm. It's like, like it's speaking to you something that's beyond the, the material, mm-hmm. right? So uh, yeah, I said you're carried off someplace yeah, else. And like you said and that's yeah. That even that ties into how you can live your life in an artistic way. In that, I mean, like Dietrich von Hildebrand has that book, The Art of Living. Yeah, um, and it's like if you live in a way that brings things together and is cohesive. Yeah then there's a beauty to your life that people perceive. And like, there's something about you that I don't, I can't really pin down, but yeah. like it, I wonder at. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, it, maybe it's, 
Yeah, ha- harmony and order. Yeah, for you sure. Know, yeah, like yeah. your your life thing. is harmonious mm-hmm. and orderly. Yeah. Like I do different yeah, you know. things in my life, and they all play a part in one grand symphony. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And not that your life is tyrannically ordered, mm-hmm. and that's yeah, why yeah. it's beautiful. But just like mm-hmm. you're not disorganized. You're not right. the opposite. In the of same way, cha- in the same chaotic, way that music yeah. works, in that like there are very strict rules. Yeah. But then you can break. Them. Sure. <laughs> you yeah. know, and they have vary. Yeah. They, right. they vary greatly. The um. My favorite example of like a person who is taken by beauty and uh, choosing to live differently because of its effect on his soul is Dante. Um, there's a great picture, and I don't know the name or the artist. I'll have to Google search just Dante. <laughs> um, but uh, of Dante walking down the street, and he's looking down, and he looks like he's hurt. And people around him are like looking at him like, like he's very weird um almost like making fun of him Mm -hmm. and he's just walking down the street like hurt and uh and i I believe the 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 painting is um uh communicating his encounter with beatrice where in his la vita nuova the the uh, short uh poems that he wrote about his encounters with beatrice or him thinking about beatrice uh he talks about uh just being taken by her sight and unable to move beyond the mundane things of life and you read it, and it, and it seems like he's being overtly dramatic, like he's just being a fool. But that's kind of how beauty works, in a sense. That like we have to kind of play the fool. Mm-hmm. We have to be taken by it. We can't hope to grasp it. Yeah. Um. And then that's once we play the fool, that's when we can rise up to be the hero. You know, in that yep. in that archetype of the fool. Uh. But I think that that's exemplified really well in Dante, and the idea that it like when he writes his Divine Comedy. That you know, it begins with him lost in sin, right? He's lost in a wood. Uh, he doesn't know how, where to get out. He doesn't know how to like symbolically. He doesn't know how to transcend mm-hmm. um, his him being lost until a symbol of beauty reaches him and says, "Hey, this is the way right. to tr- climb the mountain." Yeah, right. Yeah. And and so that's um, uh, symbolized by Virgil's poetry, right? Uh, the beauty that um, Dante found in his master, mm-hmm. his, his, uh, Virgil's uh, own poetry. Mm-hmm. But then Virgil says that he was sent by Beatrice. Right. And so in a sense, you know, it's, it's fascinating because the, the archetype of beauty as portrayed by Beatrice was given voice by Virgil's poetry, yeah. right? And, and then that's what Dante is chasing. Right. Um, and so... And that's how you get the hierarchy of loves. Yeah. Because you know, then Beatrice yeah, yeah, yeah. takes him to heaven and then yeah. ultimately to Christ. Right. Um, yeah. And that yeah. chain, that chain of, uh, of evangelization. Right. If you want to put it like that, mm. um, it's uh, Mary, yep. the mother of God, who sends St. Lucy, mm-hmm. uh, Dante's patron saint, uh, to Beatrice, yep. to Virgil. Yep. And it's that chain um, that's it's a, leading it's a, him to God. It's a perception of beauty and then a love, and that you climb that. Yeah. And I mean, that's what I really want to get at back to that conversation about like, you know, do we need businessmen or like, you know, is that, yeah. you know, whatever. Um, because that could be the means. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, like, yeah. like if that in particular is drawing yeah. you in because of your, um, you know, your personality yeah. and what, what your interests are, the chain goes all the way back to Christ always. Right. Yeah. And yeah. so like, that's why, that's why beauty has that fractal element where yeah. it's like, like, you get the feast and like find what's interesting to you. And then in that, you're going to get there anyway. Yeah. Yeah, right. Exactly. And, um, and that's what we see in a divine comedy is that uh, Dante experiences all these levels of human nature and all these levels of reality at large, where he's commenting on astronomy and philosophy and right. theology and history and his current politics. Mm-hmm. Everything's in it yeah. because it's ordered by beauty and love. Yeah. Uh, and he's right. able to, see it in a hierarchy that leads to God. Mm-hmm. But it's because of that inspiration of beauty that uh, as he was affected. I got to find that painting because it's, it's the beginning of his journey. Right. Where That's he's pierced by beauty, pe- like to the extent where people are like, what's up with that guy? Uh-huh. And then he's like, I'm going to embark on an, an adventure. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. yeah. Dante's a very like medieval man. Oh in yeah, that the way. perfect Renaissance man. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah. like a Renaissance man before the Renaissance. Yeah. He said he 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 puts together all these pieces. Yeah. Uh, to create this poem, and even at the very end of it, or this, yeah, it's epic, right? Epic yeah, poem. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and at the end of it, you know, he beholds God and says, that, uh, "God is that which the love that moves the oh, yeah. sun, you know, the, the sun and the other stars, the sun and the other stars." Exactly. So 
the whole this whole yeah. organizing principle yep. that brought him to this point was love. Yeah. Like you said, all, yeah. all these things are connected to the one God in love. Exactly. And the way that he paints his picture, um, you know, uh, well, this is this is not just Dante, but this is uh, the medieval view of the universe, right? The Ptolemic um, universe is that the earth is in the center, the stars and the planets around it, and then God is outside of that. And so mm. to say that the love which moves the sun and the other stars is that exactly that organizing principle which gives beauty to the entire hierarchy, mm-hmm. right. hierarchy and yep. reality. Yeah. It's, yeah. I got to we should read that again. I need to read Dante again. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's been a while. Um, man. <laughs> um, I think some of the, uh, one of the other points I wanted to make about this whole being able to make connections in this time particularly um, is the idea that it seems like uh, we're really like prepped for symbolic thinking uh, because, because of emojis. <laughs> <laughs> but like seriously though, yeah. like the use of emojis and memes is a really interesting phenomenon in that like we're trying to represent a universal experience with an image. Mm-hmm. Mm. Right. Yeah. And we say like, we, we, you know, it's some GIF or whatever. And it's like, Oh, that's me. Or like <laughs> me when I'm late for work. It's yeah, like yeah. <laughs> what you're actually doing is, is you're, you're layering experiential realities yeah. into one finite narrative. Yeah. Um, and so, and then, you know, the same thing with emojis, like we're almost like back to hieroglyphs of like just talking in these symbolic yeah. forms. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And right. it's, and it seems like we're, we're already, we're ready for the, the, for beauty to come in and be like, here are more connections. Yeah. Um, it just, it's just really interesting yeah. phenomenon. I mean, now. and going back all the way to the beginning of our conversation with language, right? Like symbols, language, we're, you know, in a, in a way tr- trying to transcend words Mm-hmm. with our symbols or, or 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 maybe another way to put it is that like we're seeing the symbol the symbolism behind language um yeah. with emojis and mm-hmm. and memes like you were yeah. saying um i, I mean I, you know on a practical level i think emojis rose um to prominence because when you send someone a text like i'm excited you can <laughs> read that sarcastically you can right. read that you know on so yeah. many levels because yeah. you're missing you know 70 percent of communication yeah, yeah. is that facial um expression right. right um and so to send emojis, like, this is what I really mean by yeah. sending these words that I'm hiding behind the right, screen, right. you know? So, yeah. Um, the idea, yeah, the two, the, um, the concept that memes are mostly funny is really interesting too, because uh, I feel like that's also the role of the comedian is to bring in different realities, mm. mm-hmm. but in a certain way that uh, is funny. Yeah. Like you bring in things that don't seem like they fit and then they do. And like that, that, yeah incongruency or congruency is what the funny is yeah um and so in a way like comedians are also pattern rec- pattern recognizers yeah, yeah. in the same way an artist is so yeah. like you know obviously comedy is an art but it's it's the same role of like you recognize these things and you gather them together yeah um and so you even see that in memes of like just because they're funny doesn't mean that there's not something else really going on culturally um yeah. about yeah. this type of expression of realities right yeah yeah whenever there's a big cultural event there's memes about it yeah yeah you know? yeah, yeah um Anything, you know, especially with anything having to do with, with Trump, anything having to do with Biden, yeah. there's immediately an explosion. I mean, as you said, there's a cultural mm-hmm. moment. Um, yeah. But in some sense, it's more a comedian's take on the cultural event. Yeah. Because it's not, you yeah. know, because if, if a meme's not funny, it's basically, what, a tweet or an article? <laughs> right. Yeah. right. You know, because right. right. it, 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 otherwise yeah. you're just relaying information. Right. Right. Yeah, exactly. guess, but sometimes, you know. sometimes memes are funny because they're true and it's... It's I, like it doesn't make me laugh when I see like a political meme, and it's more just like it's funny in a way that this could be represented this way, and it's true. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just yeah, yeah it's just really yeah, yeah. interesting. Well, and I mean, I think comedy is really an uh, under um, appreciated art because I, I I think it was it probably Chesterton touches on this, but I've heard uh, you know even the Christian narrative can be understood as a comedy. Well, I mean, divine right comedy. back to Dante. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so always Dante. Right. Um, no, but seeing like, yeah, in, in the grand sense, um, comedy is means that, uh, it just means that there's a story with a happy ending yeah. at, at the simplest terms. But even the elements of uh, the salvation history where you have Mary, for example, um, being the handmaid of the Lord, simple servant, is crushing the head of the highest angel, 
right? Right, the fallen angel, Satan. Mm -hmm. That's irony at its finest, yeah. right? First meme ever. <laughs> yeah, no, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, or you know, God, the uh, prime mover, mm -hmm. um, the source of all things, mm -hmm. becomes man. Right. Irony. Crucified. Right. Criminal. Yeah. yeah, and and so all those elements of Christianity have at their heart a sense of irony. Yeah. Um, which is a form of comedy. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so to understand all these elements that are dramatic, awe-inspiring, yeah. um, you know, on the face of it, tragic. Mm -hmm. But then to say, well, no, it's actually all a comedy, right? right? It's and it's that's a really interesting way. To, it's to it's see interesting too, reality. like you were saying, when some some big event happens, all the memes start showing up, and it's like there's almost like this language um, or narrative that we have in our collective mind about how to express reality. Mm -hmm. So when it comes up, you whip out the old memes and you reword it. And it, so it says something about the current event. Yeah. And so it's like, you're trying to tie it back through a through line that happens to be like memes yeah. um, of the culture. And like, that's how we're, that's how we're like making sense of reality. Yeah. It's just really interesting to right. watch. Yeah. I was going to say the memes sometimes almost are like a pop version of like a collective unconscious or something. Yeah. For like sure. rising up mm -hmm. out of the unconscious. Um, I know the, I don't know the precise origin of memes, but I know I, a, a somewhat distant origin of them is in 4chan. <laughs> and so that's a pretty, like, that's that's not so much a Jungian understanding of the collective unconscious. It's more probably a Freudian as a place yeah. of darkness, a place yeah. of repression, <laughs> uh -huh. a place of anger, you know. Um, and, you know, there they were like, it, it's very interesting because they were very primitive. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember any of these, um, like Bachelor Frog, yeah, yeah, or oh, yeah. was it Insanity Wolf? You know, yeah, it's yeah. just like it was like one little picture, a <laughs> right. couple little lines. Yeah. But now it's like they were kind of swirling in the yeah. collective unconscious, and now they've like erupted yeah. into the consciousness, it's the mainstream, yeah. right? But yeah. now they've taken on a more complex form, right? Yeah, um, super weird. Yeah, it's it, it's a it's a strange phenomenon. On one hand, it's it's just very funny, but if you look at it a little bit more deeply, it's a strange phenomenon. Like I said, mm -hmm. especially that these templates. And that there's something intuitive about them right. insofar as, uh, have you ever tried to explain a meme to somebody? Yeah. yeah. Right. It's right. not funny. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. It's, uh -huh. it's like, oh, well, you know, there's a button on one side and there's a button on the other and a guy's yeah. sweating. <laughs> and he doesn't know which one, to, you know, it's right. like, oh, that's not funny. Yeah. <laughs> like, right, that's, yeah right. But then if you show it, yeah. right. it's like, oh, they, yeah, this is funny. But then when you bring something, when you bring an element of reality on top of it, yeah. like the words, the language on the meme is right. what it makes it pop. Yeah. When it's like me deciding what to do today or whatever it is, like that's when it's like, oh, I see now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As opposed to a dissecting of like, here's what this means. Right. It doesn't have the same yeah. element. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, really yeah that was that was just <laughs> I was thinking about memes the other day. Um, <laughs> well, they're everywhere. They're inescapable. Yeah, yeah for sure. Know, they're um a good place to stop though. Um if you guys want to follow us um on social media, it's basically related podcast. Um on Instagram and YouTube, basically related.com forward slash AMA um, to ask us questions. Um, only members get the uh, the once a month episode where we at answer all the questions. That's basically related.com forward slash support. Um, you can support us there. Um, I'm Matt Hylam everywhere. Lee is at Coach Lieb. Father John is still hidden from the social media the, from <laughs> from google um. the hidden life <laughs> yes yeah all right we'll stop there thanks guys see you